Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending to today's talk. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about OSPOs, try to demystify some what, what is an OSPO and, and uh, some of the patterns of an OSPO, and also get the chance to talk about what inner source can bring to emerging open source initiatives or OSPOs. So I will be following this agenda. Um, the first uh, topic will be more related with what do we mean with OSPOs? Uh, why is this starting to pop everywhere <laughs> around the world? Is that a buzzword? Is it actually a real thing? What do we, uh, how can we define an OSPO and so on? Then we will move to the evolution of, it, of the OSPO case. Uh, it, it hasn't been a, um, a new term. It has been here for a while, but it has evolved along these years. Then we'll move to uh, some inner source trends in OSPO, how other organizations and companies um, are, uh, are dealing with that, and, and some inner source patterns we are seeing in actual established OSPOs or similar open source initiatives. And finally, if I have time, I would like to share with you some idea I have about cross-community collaboration and how cross-community can excel uh, these OSPOs and open source initiatives. All right, so let's start with the first topic. And um, here I would like first to focus on, on, on the topic around innovation and how um, organizations right now are trying to face digital transformation uh, with uh, trying to implement so many different um, approaches and so on. And um, we see when we talk about the innovation race, we see that um, software is always there, right? So software is in any organization nowadays. And what is powering software in many cases, in fact, almost the 80% of the software components for modern applications are running on open source. So if we, want, if we are talking about uh, how to foster innovation and how to face digital transformation within organizations, at some point, we need to think about software and we need to then think about open source. So we are no longer talking about the innovation race. We are talking about an open source race. And here is the trick, because open source um, has so many different paths, activities, and, and, and things an uh, organization needs to be focused at. So here are some of the, some of the examples, like, uh, when the organization needs to adopt open source, they need to think about what infrastructure should be they uh, adopting, uh, create new policies, new standards, try to embrace cultural change within the organization, um, set up the tooling, and take care of the software competition analysis, and more and more activities. So some organizations, what they have been doing so far is say, OK, let's build a strategy on top of all these activities. Let's bring alignment to all these activities and bring a strategic place for all the open source activities that the organization should be uh, focusing at. And Actually, that is what an OSPO is. It doesn't matter if you call it an OSPO, uh, open source office, or open source program, or open source strategic center. Uh, there are several ways to call an OSPO. But uh, the essence of the OSPO is to be uh, this, is this to put a strategy on top of open source activities. Because with the strategy, you will have more alignment. And if you have alignment, you will um, ease the open source adoption at some point. It's not just contributing or using open source ad hoc. It's having a strategy uh, to accelerate this open source, um, this open source process adoption. And that's, that will increase then in innovation. So the way I, I like to, to see OSPOs are like the open source accelerator, accelerators for organizations. 
And uh, just to be also more specific, uh, the OSPO, what it lands, it's, it's more like the link spin between the organization and the open source ecosystem. OK, that, that, that's all. That is what an OSPO is. It's easy, right? <laughs> it seems like, OK, it's clear. It's a strategy. OK, but uh, sometimes um, I, I, I come from the Twitter group that it's an open group of organizations focused on open source program offices. And sometimes, many times, that is not enough. Like, organizations need sometimes to see uh, some kind of pattern of how to, how to start, how to evolve, and, and have a better framework or, or of uh, where, are the, uh, where are the limits of the OSPO and how is it structured. So um, I also like to now to uh, share three main questions and three main issues that I've been hearing a lot from other organizations uh, that are, um, what is exactly an OSPO? Like, what characteristics should an OSPO have? Uh, also, in terms of what are the different stages that an OSPO can adopt? And uh, some of the different OSPO behaviors that we can find. Again, this is not uh, uh, just a fixed um, place to do this. It's more like some examples of uh, how other organizations are, are structuring this OSPO, uh, their OSPO. OK, so first, up, first step is what defines an OSPO. Uh, this comes from the latest study from the Twitter group in collaboration with the Linux research that uh, we're defining some uh, OSPO personas and uh, five characteristics that can help people to better uh, understand what is an OSPO. So um, according to this research, what defines an OSPO is the first, employees are tasked with fostering and nurturing open source usage. Second, the organization has a formal policy around the consumption of open source. Third, um, the top level managers and the executive recognize open source uh, as, a, um, as a, um, a strategic asset. Uh, fourth, um, there are some numbers of employees that are tasked to contributing code to open source projects. And the last one, um, all procedures, processes, and tooling are uh, set it. Uh, to facilitate open source consums consumption and participation. So this five, with these five characteristics, if your organization is uh, working on that or doing that, uh, you can perfectly think, OK, this, this is kind of what an OSPO is like. And again, it doesn't matter about the branding you, you tell them. It's more about this, if, if these characteristics are met. Um, also, I've left you the link to the study. And there is a, a great conversation we had about other ways to call an OSPO in the OSPO forum that people can also um, take a look at. Uh, the next point is um, there was some questions about people saying, hey, but an OSPO is not just a, a template, right? a broad template template that everyone can take and apply. Uh, it depends on the goals the organization has and the industry where the organization came from, if it's a private organization or a public organization. Uh, there have many different ways to behave. And that is something we also bring in the study, that uh, we bring some OSPO personas that, again, these OSPO personas are not just, OK, you have this, and that's all. Um, this is a dynamic study. We would love the community to contribute to more perspective, more OSPO personas to, um, to bring more value to this uh, kind of um, division. Uh, but so far, you can see, like, if you go to the study, you will see, like, the uh, six personas we develop. And might be organizations that just look at this um, segmentation and say, hey, but I'm, I'm kind of uh, open source first and cross-industry collaborative. I have both. Well, it's because uh, they are not, um, 
they are not siloed, but you can have a, a little bit of mix of uh, some characteristics, but it might help you to better frame where your what what's the kind of your OSPO. And if you see other OSPOs with this similar uh, behavior, you might it might be easier for you to go and check that kind of resources and how, how those OSPOs are, are doing, and it will help you to advance in your open source journey. And last, it was, uh, uh, there was another discussion about, um, well, uh, what are the different stages, if, if I'm building an open source initiative, the different stages that uh, an OSPO can take. Right, um, Cornelius did a great um, talk uh, previously in the States too, talking about this model and other models, uh, more focused not only in OSPOS, but uh, in open source adoption. Um, and he said uh, several ones. This is one, the, the one that it's uh, related with Tutor Group and OSPOS and the study that I was mentioning earlier. So in this, uh, in this study, you can see that uh, at the very beginning, there is no even an OSPO. There is some open source ad hoc, like organizations notice that their developers are uh, using open source at some point to do their job, and that is a reality. And then the organizations start to have awareness of that and say, hey, we sue, maybe. Uh, take care of that, about that. That usually happens in the legal side. And when that happens, when there is um, awareness in that organization that we should seriously be, taken, be uh, taking open source seriously, put on a strategy on top of that, it starts uh, the legal education, usually, is that what happens. Uh, and it's everything around providing open source software compliance, inventory, and developer education in term, uh, to legal uh, things. So there are policies, and everything related with um, uh, risk managers, what open source projects will they be contributing at, what is a CLA, for instance, like even basic stuff in terms of uh, legal education. Once that is covered, move to community education. So that is more about ev ev um, evangelizing open source use and ecosystem participation. As you can see, this. Whoop, you cannot see now? Oh, no, you can see. OK. <laughs> uh, as you can see, um, these stages are um, cumulative. So it doesn't matter if you move to the community education, it doesn't mean that you stop doing legal education. I mean, you're still uh, working on the legal side, but then you have uh, more ability to execute, and you are able to also invest on community education. And these three stages are really, really important because those are the, the most, the, the first ones. And uh, where the, when the early stages OSPOS start, usually are in these three first stages. And then once they have covered this, once they have this developer education um, in place, they move to the engagement stage. So that is more like the visible part of the OSPO. It's when the OSPO has that power to say, OK, let's contribute outbound to open source. Uh, let's start hosting open source projects. Let's start growing communities. So, so this is more like the, the visible side, right? And finally, uh, the most major OSPOs might be thinking about, OK, we have covered all these stages. Let's see how can we become a strategic decision-making plan uh, partner within the organization, and how the OSPO can be this strategic partner for the IT, or for the CTO, or for, for strategic places within the organization to help them make decisions. OK, so now uh, we can move. Now we have seen all the, uh, what is an OSPO is, and, and how these OSPOs can be structured, at least some examples. So let's, let's go now to some uh, story of, of the OSPO. Uh, and if this is actually a real thing or it's just a buzzword that people are starting to talk about nowadays. So to explain you this, I would like to share uh, 
this recent study we did in collaboration with Aleph Research uh, that basically shares some insights about how OSPOs are getting bigger and bigger in terms of there is, um, it seems to be more increase in funding for open source initiatives. Um, established OSPO have already highlighted improved code quality. Um, more than 77% of respondents says that open source program had a positive impact in their organization. And, the, and we are seeing more OSPO jobs, like actually jobs that says um, uh, OSPO or open source initiatives within uh, the job description. So that is great news for the OSPO ecosystem because it seems that it's getting more formalized. And also to see like how big is this OSPO ecosystem going? Um, this is, comes from the OSPO landscape where um, we try to map all the OSPO adopters that in, in a public way they say they have an OSPO. And you can see there are a lot of organizations from all over the world, all over the uh, industries, public and private. But also take into account that these are the OSPOs that share that, that share that, hey, we are doing an open source initiative, and here is um, the work we have done. But we also have to think about the work in, prog in progress OSPOs. So those OSPOs that they are not official yet. Maybe they are doing open source ad hoc and trying to learn from others how to uh, go to one step to another. And also the early stage OSPOs that, um, yes, we have an OSPO, but you know, we, we, we still don't want to make that public yet. Like we say it, but we don't want to like, have a lot of presence until we start to do some work. So that is something that must take into account. And these are some real examples, uh, some real news about different organizations from different sectors, public and private, that officially serve they have an OSPO. Ports, um, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, the uh, European Commission, and the last new, the World Health Organization is launching its open source program office, which is amazing. And they are based also, they are looking for a job position on OSPO manager. Uh, and I think they're asking it for Berlin, so to be based in Berlin, just in case. Okay, so now that we have Sarah, some of the OSP evolution, let's move to the next topic that are inner source trends in OSPOS. And before starting, just to let you know that yesterday, uh, during the virtual event at FOSS Backstage, we did a really interesting uh, topic about this, uh, about inner source and OSPOS and institutionalizing open source cultural change with Isabel, with Isabel, with Tim, with uh, Claire and I. And um, it was a panel discussion and we bring really interesting topics there. So I really recommend you to go and check that. And also, I would like to start with some examples that say that that see that where you can see that uh, how inner source is being implemented within the OSPOS. Uh, the first example is uh, from uh, the World Health Organization. So these are like uh, a nice chart saying like where uh, the World Health Organization teams thinks an OSPOS so initially focus. And as you can see, one of the columns, it's in entire internal culture. Like try to bring an open source culture within organization that for those who doesn't know that it's inner source, basically. Um, then this comes from one of our to-do apology sessions where we invited Aliander uh, from the Netherlands energy sector and they were sharing like their OSPO journey, which it was great. And in, in that chart, in that OSPO journey, they highlighted uh, the launch of Aliander's inner source portal, portal. So they even call it inner source. And uh, the publicity share that they are having an OSPO, but within the OSPO, they have an inner source team. 
also uh, from SIP, uh, that is, I think it was like some months ago, they saw like how their OSPO is structured in one of their recent blog posts. And uh, here you can see like the tasks of the entire OSPOs are clustered in work streams, okay? And so in one of those work streams is in our source. And this, this is the long one. Um, I think near from was the ones that that served this use case that is lessons from a journey to inner source at Comcast. But that inner source practices are also within the OSPUS. Uh, and they they don't call it inner source, they said growing open source culture inside of Comcast. So you can see, even though they don't call it inner source, the need for developer education on how to engage with open source. It's a reality. It's something that in OSPOS needs to happen. Also, in our recent studies, there was a question that was, what are the primary responsibilities of the open source programs? And the majority of respondents, the first one, was fostering an open source culture within our organization, that it's in our source. And what is happening that? Why, why, ha why is this happening? Um, if, you, if you remember this chart I shared with you earlier, that is, OSPO is the linchpin between the organization and the open source ecosystem, you need to take care of a lot of the organization side first, right? In fact, you need to meet two criteria internally in order to move forward. Uh, from my perspective, it will be build a safe environment, so um, legal education, and second, build a supportive environment, that is community education. But all that, it's happening within the walls of the organization. And surprise, that it's also in the um, maturity model where the first stages, once the organization starts to uh, develop an OSPOS, uh, needs to take care about. Um, like right, uh, like before starting with engagement and leadership, they need to focus on legal and community education. And okay, now let's move to the last part. And this is more like some ideas I wanted to share with you. And uh, right after this talk, I would like to share your feed to see what do you think about this, uh, if it makes sense or not, and also bring some discussions with the community. Okay, so if you remember, I said that OSPOs are the open source accelerators because they can drive innovation. But how can we accelerate OSPOs? Are there any ways to do that? Well, I think, I think there are, and that is due to the power of communities. I think communities are really, really important, and bring networking spaces and resources together can help a lot accelerate those OSPOs. But um, when organizations start to engage with communities in the open source, it's sometimes really overwhelming, like how many different communities are out there, and uh, how they engage, and the different foundation, and the different players, they, they take part on those communities, right? So from the OSPO perspective, and also for the ISPO, that comes from inner source program office perspective, um, I think that maybe a, a great idea, or a good idea, could be to try to differentiate um, these kind of communities. Because we have communities that has an expertise in an industry, like for instance, uh, Finos from uh, FinTech. Uh, it's really focused on driving open source adoption from the bank to the banking sector and finance sector. They are really specialized in that industry. Um, or also LF Energy, for instance, they are specialized in uh, bringing uh, open source adoption for, ener for the energy sector. So those are. Um, those are communities that can be the enablers when starting in open source. Then we have the facilitators. So facilitators 
uh, has the expertise in a specific subject. So for instance, if you take a look to, uh, if you take a look to the uh, stages I shared with you uh, before, you can see that, for instance, if our organization is focused on first having legal education and having open source compliance standards, maybe there are certain communities out there uh, where they can rely on, and, and for instance, Open Change or um, XVDX or OSSF and many, many more. Uh, not only in the Linux Foundation, also in other foundations, of course. Um, but they, can, they are the expertise of certain topics. Or for instance, if you're thinking about metrics and open source sustainability, maybe looking at things such as chaos um, for that section. And finally, we have the guide communities. So those communities that has expertise in open source program offices or inner source program offices, adoption and growth. And they are, it's more like an overview of all this. So for instance, uh, from the inner source side, inner source commons is a great community to start at. Um, Judo group, OSPO plus plus, I mean, there are so many different organizations there that are uh, doing this guide efforts to help uh, organizations to excel in their OSP, uh, open source journey. Uh, and I will say also that you might find communities that are a mix between two or, or like between both. Maybe there are communities that are a enable and also a guide. And just to finish with today's talk, some remarks for, for this, uh, for this um, talk. So first one, OSPOs are a way to bring strategy to open source efforts. Second, inner source teams can become the expertise team for OSPO, uh, for the OSPO engineering or developer education. And third, OSPOs can reduce inner source resources for their practices to avoid duplicated effort. Uh, just a short story about what is Studio Group. So we are an uh, open community of more than 70 organizations all around the world and more than 1,000 uh, OSPOers because Studio Group is not just about the general members, it's about its great community that are contributing to uh, the open uh, project itself and working together to drive us both to the next level. And we were funded in, uh, it's been now a long time, uh, ha and working to run open source program setup. And we have great resources here. Uh, this is just an overview of all the different sections. Uh, you can, as uh, community can start uh, joining these um, resources. We have great OSPO network, education, training, research, and OSPO tools. You can go to, uh, to do the to do GitHub repo, and also if you check the to do uh, group.org page slash community, uh, there is a great onboarding guide for new people, newcomers that wants to join the community. And last but not least, a little bit about myself. Um, I started um, with open source in Viterbia. For those who doesn't know, it's a uh, software development analytics firm, especially I see it in open source program offices, inner source, and software development metrics. Uh, currently, I'm the OSPO program manager at Tutu Group. I also, last year, I finished my uh, thesis uh, for my last master's degree in data science, uh, where I was focusing more on developer and open source developer relations metrics. I'm also involved in other communities such as Chaos, to the group, of course, Inner Source Commons, DevRel Collective, or DevRel Spain. Uh, that is my Twitter. If you want to follow me on LinkedIn, it's Ana Jimenez Santa Maria. Um, and yeah, thank you. I've also let you know that I will share these slides in my social media. So if you want to follow me to be up to date of, of these uh, resources, you're welcome to, to uh, follow me. And uh, there I also share the link to join the Twitter community and the link to join the Inner Source Commons community. 
uh, and thank you so much.